everyone, and welcome to a brand new edition of the MSG 150 at Home. It's great to have you with us. Bill Pito along with John Wallace, Michelle Jingris, and Alan Hahn. Hope everyone had a great weekend. As always, we begin by thanking those on the front lines who are putting themselves at risk to care for those who need it the most. Continued great job by everybody on the front lines as we continue to get through this pandemic. And it's great to see everyone. Hope everyone had a great weekend. Been a great weekend. Um, happy birthday to you, Bill. We have uh, we have some signage, right, Michelle? There we go. <laughs> there you go. People at home don't realize before every segment we do when we tape, Bill holds up. Right. Look. Placard. There you one. go. He does it in that way where it's like his his whole right. Face is right. right. <laughs> segment two. <laughs> so just so, so everybody's on the up. same page. Michelle made up a special placard for Bill to celebrate. <laughs> his, uh, Happy birthday. We want to say that. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Thank Happy you guys birthday. very much. Now, Happy what number? What number What's that, John? I, Happy birthday, Bill. And I would sing to you, but I don't have any Kool-Aid in the house right now. I need Kool-Aid to sing. So can you laugh happy birthday? <laughs> can you laugh happy birthday? That would be great. I thought we were singing, John. Before the show, you were singing 50 Cent. It's your birthday. Well, singing it, singing yeah. and rapping is different. I can rap with no Kool-Aid, but when I sing, I need Kool-Aid. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, uh, thanks for the wishes. And last night, uh, Episodes one and two of The Last Dance, the ESPN documentary on Michael Jordan's last season. And I was struck the most, and there were so many things to talk about, but the awful relationship between Jerry Krause and the players and Jerry Krause and Phil Jackson. You wonder, Alan, if out of spite, Krause said, I can't take this because of the personal situation, and that's why this is the last season for all this. Because if he could have put that aside, you can make the case that this group had more championships to win if they weren't broken up. We would never, we, maybe we would have gotten to see them play the Lakers, but who would have coached them? Phil, you know, Phil coached the Lakers later on, but we never got to see those two pads cross when Kobe and Shaq became the best team in the league right after. I mean, basically two years later, the next dynasty showed up. But, I, you know, what the, the sad part, of course, is Jerry Krause passed away and wouldn't have a chance to speak up for himself during this documentary. We have a lot of old clips that we've seen of him doing a lot of very candid interviews. Imagine, once again, if social media was around in the 90s with this team. Oh, my goodness. Oh. Stuff that was being said publicly about each other. Um, but I just – I can't fathom just the thinking of we just won our fifth title in seven years – and we, re we still have the best player in the world on our roster. And let's break this up. Like, as if, like it's like almost Bill Belichick thinking, I'm going to trade you before your decline begins while you're still valuable. But this is completely different. Can you imagine in today's world, a general manager publicly saying, this will be it. <laughs> this is the last time we're going to have this group together when all they've done is win. And not even just win, win championships mind-boggling that they didn't allow this team to just grow old gracefully and instead it had to come to such a tumultuous ending and there's a lot of other stories of course that go along with this as well to, just to your point alan it also to me kind of showed like the lack of power and influence that a superstar player had then as opposed to maybe now um, Jordan publicly coming out and saying that the team should be able to defend its title. Him saying that he wouldn't play if he if Phil Jackson wasn't his coach, and the Bulls just being like, nah, nah, we'll see about that. Um, that would never happen today. And I and I think you you talk about social media as well. Like we're learning these stories about you know Scottie Pippen going at it with Kraus on the bus and things things that you would never in today's day and age that would just like never go without being said like it would come out that there was there was issues there was animosity um yeah so it, it's a remarkable remarkable documentary so far well for for me the whole what, what stuck out the most to me was scotty pippen saying basically he wasn't going to mess up his summer to have surgery which i you know and jordan touched on a little bit saying how selfish that was but i just couldn't believe coming off your fifth championship and you you'd opt to not to not uh, have the surgery early to what to sabotage the team? I, I mean, I think Scotty being obviously the the greatest second fiddle you ever want to you know to championship team, but the way he kind of sullied his own name in terms of uh you know taking himself out the game when the play wasn't called for him for Tony Kukoc that year, 
and towards the, you know, the 97, 98 season, basically letting Jordan and Rodman kind of man the ship by themselves early in that, uh, in that season before he came back. I just couldn't believe that Scotty took that, that, that stance. And when you have someone like Michael Jordan next to you, from a business standpoint, Scotty, Michael Jordan was underpaid for mo- the bulk of his career too. He made up for it by off, off the court marketing and all that. And the, and the same thing that Scotty could have did, he, all he had to do was uh, tap into Michael Jordan can you connect me with some of the off-court deals you have going on? Because when you're a champion, as you know, Alan, Bill, and Michelle, when you're a champion, those deals come your way readily, every day, all day. So he could have made up for the lack of the money he's making in, a, in his NBA contract by off-court and marketing deals. And I think he, he didn't take it full advantage of that, especially when you had the most marketable player in the history of sports on your team. All you had to do is, you know, uh, tap his shoulder, like, is there any way you can help me out with this with, with some marketing deal? And I think Jordan would have walked him right in. <laughs> would have walked him right into some deal. Yeah, you know, if I could, Bill. Also, let me throw out to everybody here because we have to give the Knicks angle to this thing because, of course, in almost the very first scene, there's Michael walking at the Garden because the Garden is the mecca of basketball, and to see the great player in his very first year walking out on the court and you know having interviews and whatnot, what an image that is. But there was a lot of Knicks connections in these first two episodes. But one that wasn't mentioned that I know from, again, reading the stories back then. And, John, you lived it. You were, you were in the NBA at this time. One of the biggest stories was going into that season when they did, weren't sure if they were going to bring Phil back. And Michael was saying what he was saying. And Scotty was saying what he was saying. There were trade rumors. One of them was Scotty being traded for Tracy McGrady on draft night. And that didn't happen. Could you imagine if that happened? Grady told that story years later. But even before that, Michael Jordan didn't have a contract. And, you know, his agents, David Falk, who also represents Patrick Ewing, there was some flirtation about Michael saying, well, you know what? I'm going to go to the Knicks. And the Knicks did everything they could to clear the cap space and whatever it took to get Michael Jordan into New York. Whether Michael used New York as leverage or not remains, you know, a story that only he and David Falk can tell. But there's still that what if out there that, that makes you cringe if you think how close maybe the Knicks came to being able to land the greatest player in the history of the game. John, have you ever seen a pettiness situation that existed like between the players and the GM? I just can't get over how they belittled Jerry Krause, not only when he was right there with them, but behind his back. I, I mean, it, it's just amazing to me that that, is how that situation got to, that they were belittling this guy right in front of his face all the time. Well, well, like Alan alluded to, uh, the late great Jerry Cross not here to defend himself. So, you know, you kind of feel bad because you don't want anyone taking shots and they're not here to defend themselves. But when I was in the NBA and during those times, Jerry Cross just wasn't a, a very likable guy, you know, in, in uh, NBA circles. He just... Because they didn't accept him. What, John, what if those players had accepted him? That could have changed the whole course of everything. Yeah, but he also had to accept the players and how important they were. And for him to say that the organizations win titles and not players, especially when you have Michael Jordan on your team, I mean, it's such a slap in the face. But I thought that Jerry Reinsdorf, being the owner, and like he did step in and gave Phil the one-year contract, I think he should have stepped in after they won their sixth one and say, look, we're not stopping this. Uh, I don't care what anyone says. We're going to bring Phil back. We're going to give Michael Jordan another 30 some million dollar contract. We're going to give Scotty whatever he wants. I think, you know, like you just don't break up that team. They won three in a row and they, and they, and Jordan was still playing at, at a very, 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 very high level. And you, and you say to that, you don't want that no more on your team. I mean, how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you walk away from Michael Jordan? And not, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> not to mention just everything you just mentioned, but also additionally, when Jordan got hurt, and he went back to UNC and they just like didn't check in on him, had no idea that he was playing and building his strength, getting better and better. He finally comes back and says, look, I've been playing five on five. Like I'm good to go. And then they're still like, okay, but you're only going to play seven minutes a game. Like I understand, you know, restricting minutes and stuff. It's your superstar, but like his, if it's true, his leg was stronger than it, his other leg. His injured leg was stronger than his other leg. And he had done all of this rehab to get to where he wanted to be. So then he obviously starts to feel like, okay, maybe the team is trying to tank on purpose. And that's not something that any, I feel like, player wants to be a part of when they're in the actual game and in the action. You can speak to that as well as a player. But they made the playoffs, guys. And in that playoff series, before game two, he's playing golf with Boston's Danny Ainge. 
And then he goes out and hits 63. I mean, what in the world is that? It's, it's oh, Jordan. Jordan. <laughs> yeah, that's where they put it, right? Well, remember what Danny Ainge said, too. Danny said that he, he took some money from Michael that afternoon when they played golf. So, you know, maybe he got him, uh, maybe he got him fired up. I, I don't know. But what watching, like watching those, you know, those games again, watching that playoff game, I remember, I remember watching that game against the Celtics, that series against the Celtics. It came, I actually was saying when I was watching with my wife that I said, I wonder if they're going to show him cross over. He crossed over Larry Bird like five times and ended up pull up jumper. And Bird at one point just stood still. Like he's like, I don't know where he's going. And, <laughs> and I said, what if, that one always stood with me because back then you never really saw anything like that. He was so bouncy. And then, of course, then that highlight came up and I thought, oh my God, like what memories those were of a player who today, a lot of players play like that. But people have to understand that back then, no one played like that. It was incredible what he could do. We'll talk about this forever, but we got to take a break. Also of note in that game, guys, Michael Jordan did not hit a single free. 63 points, not a single three-pointer made. And his legend was just getting started. So we could talk about it all show, but coming up next, we have to give John Wallace a break. As we know, he's not in the best of shape. So it's going to be <laughs> Michelle, myself, and Alan Hahn with former Giants punter Jeff Fiegels getting you ready for the NFL draft. And we continue on the MSG 150 at home right after this. 